Hello, dear foodie friends, and welcome to Kitchen Chat. This is your founder and co-host, Margaret McSweeney, along with Chef Jamie Larita, our co-host, and we are so glad you're here. And this is such an exciting moment, truly. I'll say. A culinary milestone. Today's guest does not need any introduction, but I'll give you a quick little peek. Chef Jeremiah Tower, who is the creator of California Cuisine, James Beard Award winner, so highly accomplished. You'll never meet anyone except for Jamie with his exquisite style. Wow. He is here on Kitchen Chat. Welcome, Chef Jeremiah Tower. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Margaret and Jamie. Pleasure to be on the show. I'm sure a lot of people have seen that wonderful documentary, The Last Magnificent, now on Netflix. Right. And we're not going to dwell on the past. I mean, what I will take a few peeks back, but we really want to celebrate the here and now and focus on the future and catch up on all the exciting things going on. But I do have one quick question sure. from the past, Chef. Could you share some fun stories about your friendship? with Julia Child, James Beard, and right. also Anthony Bourdain. Right. Well, my favorite thing about Anthony, I can't really say on this show, but I can talk about <laughs> Julia Child. Um, I first met her at a market in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Savannah's, and I had ordered a goose, and they brought it out to me, and it was frozen, and they said, no, it's not, it's fresh, and so I was arguing with them. And this voice behind me said, looks frozen to me. And that was, I turned around and there was Julia Child. So we became <clears throat> friends after that. As, as for James, you know, he constantly, when I was in Shape and Ease and later on in the Net Stars, he was constantly saying, you know, you must come to New York, you must do this job, you must come and meet Joe Baum. We're going to do a thing called Windows on the World. So I did, and I met Joe Baum at the top before they'd finished it. Um, so James was always interfering, saying, you're completely wasted in California. You have to come to New York. That was his almost monthly telephone call to me. I am a fabulous gay man as well. And I have to say that when I was in culinary school at the Culinary Institute of America, I, my one goal was to work at STARS. And I wrote you a letter and received a response that you guys didn't need me. And it broke my heart. I honestly was just like, but I have to say you missed the boat with me because I, I was say, just- That breaks my heart to hear that. <laughs> well, it just, it was something that was like, at the time it was in the nineties, right? And we all know yeah. what the nineties were about for mm -hmm. us. And um, it was like, here I was in culinary school as uh, a gay man that wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. And I thought I really wanted to work for um, a gay man, right. and and I thought that was where I would like feel the most comfortable, and it was something that um, you know when I looked at your career, and I I know you're a fabulous chef, and I know you're an amazing uh, cook and all that, but I see I see you as more of a creative genius. If I say that to you, wow. that I I feel like you're a creative genius. How does that make you feel? And being someone that's also like you and I resonate, you don't know, you don't know me, but when I watched your documentary, I was frozen for the first half of it because I resonated with you on so many things from your father to your childhood. Mine was a bit different, but the feelings were the same. So being someone that I look at as someone that possesses that kind of creative energy, what is it like to be on that edge of the night? Like explain to me, because I don't have the life you lived, I never reached those great heights in the restaurant because I don't think I could have handled it because I'm too, uh, too much of a control freak. What is it like to be on the edge like that? Well, the best answer I can give you uh, is the, what happened to Anthony Bourdain. We talked a lot about fame and uh, I mean, I wasn't ever as same as, as he because I didn't have that television, uh, television shows and, and the life on television. But he had finally gotten very tired of people coming up to him and saying, oh, you're Anthony Bourdain, I always wanted to meet you, you know, that, and on and on and on. I mean, I'll tell you the story about Anthony. I was, after uh, the documentary had just come out, we went on CBS with Charlie Rose and we got out of the limo and we're walking along the sidewalk 
And across the street were about 30 professional teamster picketers. And they really know how to make noise. So they were called, they saw Anthony and they said, hey, Tony, 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 you know, incredible noise. And he walked across the street and he said, guys, I'm going to do a show in a few minutes. Could you keep it down for about 20 minutes? And they turned into mice. I mean, these are professional teamster pickers <laughs> in New York City. Yeah. And that was I the power. That. He had that appeal to the people on the street as well as oh, just about everybody. But he got tired of that. You, were, you are famous and you, you have fame. How do you describe fame? Well, I mean, fame is great for making money. It should fill restaurants. Apart from that, it's useless. <laughs> if you believe in your fame, you're done, completely done. I love, I love that you just yes. said that. That is exactly what I wanted to hear. And I believe that too. In the late yes. 80s, Time Magazine said that I was more famous than Meryl Streep. Of course, that was absolute rubbish, but they were trying to make a point that is how could a chef be as famous as a, Holly, a big Hollywood star? And of course, that's what happened in our world in the United States. But Margaret, yes. as, you know, as you know, you know, you were, I think, the pioneer that made celebrity chefs celebrities. Absolutely. The first celebrity chef, indeed. Yeah. That's just because I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> but you look great, I have to say. You look really good. Thank you. Yes, so much. Well, one of my favorite words, chef, it was something that was handed down from my father, and that's why I do kitchen chat with Jamie is honoring my late father and to understand what his joy was. But one of his words that he instilled in me was sizzle. What does sizzle mean to you from, I guess, a professional and a personal side? Sizzle to me means basically uh, having a, a stock of chilled champagne that never runs out before the end of the day. I love that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. See, we just resonate on every level. We should be having champagne and toasting. We are. We will. We will have to. Shape and Ethan always had some of those, you know, deep buckets under my uh, work table with ice and champagne. Oh. You know, it was really kind of funny when I watched the documentary. You know, uh, Alice Waters was somebody else that, like, you know, right. I, I respect mm -hmm. in the industry. But man, you guys had fun. You guys were wild. I didn't realize that things were like. Of course it was the times, but you guys seemed like you had a lot of fun in that kitchen. Well, I played opera at full volume every night so that I didn't have to hear the, what anyone was saying. Didn't want to listen to the <laughs> chat of the waiters. Uh, I think, you know, I'm a believer that if you, can, if you have to, if you talk in the kitchen, there should be one person talking and it should be absolutely minimal. Cooks who stand there and talk about football and their girlfriends from last night, they're not cooking. You know, it's a social hour. How can you talk about the game you saw last week on the weekend and still cook absolutely food as perfect as it is at Le Bernardin, for instance. It seems like a boring conversation. Yeah. Uh, truly, uh, back on the music theme, a maestro in the kitchen. And my father was a lyric tenor, and uh, I just mm -hmm. love that connection with the music. Where, was there a lot of singing in the kitchen? But I'm all. sorry, I didn't know you, Father. I would have asked him to come to Shape and and sing. He would have loved that. I'll, I'll send you a, a copy you recorded with the London Philharmonic. Just wow. such a beautiful oh, serious. voice. Serious. Yes. I don't yes. know if you guys know this, but I actually, I actually have a bit of a singing voice myself. <laughs> I'm just saying, if, there, if the opportunity ever presents itself, I mean, just let me know. And my next oh. restaurant will have you singing. Oh yeah, yes. for sure. Speaking of yes. that, yeah, speaking <laughs> of that, like we're talking about now, like first of all, what's going on right now with you? Like in your life, this uh, what time is it there? And where it's, are you? Uh, I'm in Puerto Vallarta, above the beach. you. That's Beautiful. why the beach scene and the painting behind me. What are you doing in Puerto Vallarta? Like what is your day like? There's a book or two that I'm writing, which will demand all my attention. I'm also working on a project. Uh, I won't know if it actually is gonna happen until the end of April, but we're working on a proposal to the Aspen Institute of Mexico to document Mexican cuisine, regional Mexican cuisine. Wow. That's one. Um, I'm investigating the young chefs, or actually young techies 
who think that they mm. put artificial intelligence into cooking, but starting with a new whole new breed of cooking videos. Have you seen a cook named Matt? You know, he does a very fast little techniques and everything, but this is what one guy who has a proposal started called Parsnip. It hasn't really gotten off the ground yet. He said, if you, I want, he wanted to encourage cooking at home. And if you're not, if you're not comfortable at cooking at home or cooking, how can you start, how can you know what's unknowable and how can you find what's unknowable? So that's what they're working on. I think it's very exciting. I worked for the, uh, I was on the board for a while of the Escoffier School of Culinary Arts, the online program. And they, a few years ago said, we're gonna do online degrees. And I said, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. <laughs> How do you taste the food? But of course, then they explained the whole thing to me and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. A 20th of the cost and uh, just brilliant ideas of how to do online schooling. Right, and then, you know, you've always been, like when we referenced the documentary, we saw like you discovering and trying to do that underwater world and everything yes. like that. Like now with the pandemic hitting and this moment in time, if you being the creative director of cuisine, that's how I respect you. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have or what would you like to tell the restaurant industry? Like where, where, sh what should they do? There was a, a big question. A food writer critic from New York uh, a week or so ago on Facebook, he posted a thing about, he went to his favorite steakhouse in New York City, which, <clears throat> excuse me, he didn't name, but it was a, a, obviously a very famous steakhouse. And he said, the menu was the same as a year and a half ago. The prices were the same. The drinks were lousy. The food wasn't good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all I could think of was, you've had a year to think about what you're gonna do with your restaurant. After the plague came the Renaissance, you know, this has been a, a world disaster, but out of chaos and disaster, I think can come the best creativity ever. So for someone to just reopen their restaurant exactly the way it was uh, is a big failure and they probably will fail. It's rethink it all, you know? I mean, hospitality, the rules of hospitality don't change. I was in a famous hotel in Los Angeles a few months ago and I went in to register and the uh, woman behind the desk said, you have to wait. And I thought to myself, well, I know I have to wait. I, you know, I'm not the queen of England for God's sakes. I don't sweep in and <laughs> get handed a key. So I waited what seemed like 10 minutes. It was probably five or six and nothing happened. I said, could you get some help, you know, to register me? She said, I told you, you had to wait. And I, no. so I turned around and walked out to the taxi and went to another hotel. Now, that was, you know, after the pandemic, that kind of thing should never happen. I'm I know. Renaissance after the plague. That's mm -hmm. so impactful. I would love to hear a little bit more, please, about the culinary taste in Mexico in this book that you're writing about the local cuisines. Can you share a peek about that? Well, the book I'm writing, I, I misled you. The book I'm writing is about my travels and what I've eaten around the world. So eating the oh, world. Oh, wow. And yes. The, the project in Mexico is to document in every possible way with video and film and books and the recipes and uh, the regions of Mexico. So the first we'll do is the Yucatan because I know that the best. So for instance, when you make, you can go everywhere around Merida and Yucatan and have cochinita which should be, you know, the pig, leg of pig or a sucking pig cooked in the ground like a clam bake. But of course, nobody does that anymore because you'd have to cart it in every morning from some village out in the jungle. But I did that for PBS. We filmed it and it was a certain wood, certain oak tree, the leaves that give a flavor to it and how it's done. And we documented that completely and then ate it. It was wow. unbelievably delicious. <laughs> So I want to do that with all the very special dishes of Yucatan, most of which have been um, ruined by you know, bad restaurant cooking. Right. Mm. Travel is something that 
uh, obviously is difficult now, but for a young budding culinarian, um, I'm sure you're going to agree that travel is something that is necessary. Yes, go, go to the market in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Wow. You'll have to start cooking and say, go to the fish market in Tangier. Exactly. Um, wow. Remember what Italy and New York was like when it opened. You know, I mean, all of that. Yeah. that for me, the inspiration always is it perfect ingredients. The ingredients, you get that itch to cook. You have to buy in Russia and start cooking. That's the real inspiration. It's not about yeah. trying to be the next TV star. Wow. Absolutely. And you have truly tasted the world and the cuisines of all the world. From that experience and that you're writing about in your book as well, what has been the most lasting taste memory that you would love to continue to create? You know, those memories can be very simple. I remember one afternoon in Marrakesh and I got back to the hotel, little hotel where I was going to have lunch. I got back pretty late. He said, you know, the kitchen is closed. And I said, oh, come on. So he went to the garden. The owner went to the garden, picked some tomatoes, which were hot from the sun, sliced them, put them on a Played, chopped some fresh herbs that scattered over the top, put sea salt on and lots of wonderful olive oil, and then brought me some Arab bread and a big bucket of beer, ice cold beer bottles. You know, and that's one of the best meals I've ever had. Yes. It was just the right timing. So I've also had at in Alsace, you know, a little mm -hmm. timbal um, pike mousse. When I cut into it, the out fell of these tiny little bone frog's legs. And of course the sauce was with black truffles and butter and white wine. And yeah, that was pretty amazing too. So it doesn't have to just... be expensive. It can oh, yeah. be simple, it has to be of the moment. Yeah, I'm just smelling the tomatoes coming from the sun, right? You, you know with the that tomato that. plant, when you pick a tomato from the full uh, mid-afternoon sun, you know that smell of the yes. tomato yes. plant. Yes. And that was the it's flavor almost... of the tomatoes. Yeah. yeah. It's like you can rub it on your wrists and Absolutely. it can even be perfume. <laughs> I love the I love the smell of a vine. I love the smell of it. I love growing vegetables as well, but the smell of the perfect in the heat is, is amazing. Yes. Oh, that is so inspiring. Well, Chef Jamie and I would love to visit you in Mexico to go on go. one of these little taste tours. That would be maybe there's still so a chance amazing. to work with you. It's like you know, sometimes the manifestation you know, it takes time. Like Margaret likes to say that God's trains run on time, right? How do you, how do, what do you think about that statement? <laughs> Very perfect, yes. Oh, that was just my dad. Remember to grab, grab a seat and get on. Exactly. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and, and know how to get off as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, true. I had to throw that in. Throw that in. <laughs> oh, well, you have just influenced so many chefs, including Jamie and uh, so many accolades and such great respect from the culinary side. In fact, our mutual friend, Barbara Lazaroff sends her best to you. Oh. She so misses you and loved going I to, I guess there were wine. Me too, how fabulous yes. is she? <laughs> yes. Her and, Instagram, just her style. Yeah, it's, speaking of style, the three yes. of you. Style and fashion are, you know, are very much uh, the same thing as great food and ingredients. Tell us about, about style and how important do you think that is in life? Style again, comes from uh, what you're working with. You know, I mean, it's Balenciaga or somebody would come in and see a piece of fabric and then start draping it. It was, it was the fabric and, and the ideas about fabric that got him going. I would imagine the same, uh, I was just finished a book on Chanel. Uh, mm. Of course, she had lots of problems, but she, it was again, the ingredients, the jewels and the fabric. So for me, it's again, the marketplace, like, you know, the market in Barcelona. Uh, instead of a chef saying, look at me, look at me, you know, I can make this pretty crazy looking dish. It may take me three hours, two hours with tweezers to do it, but I can do it. And it's all about me. That's not style. That's just a visual shock. Style has to come within and it's what you're working with. The real style is, you know, finding the perfect fish, for instance, 
knowing how to take care of it, knowing how to cook it, and knowing what in what environment ambiance to serve it to your paying customers. That's much more style than I can cover this fish with 14 or 15 different ingredients and look at me, look at me. I want to say, you know, look at the fish. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's the fish. I mean, there's nothing more stylish than a black truffle soup. You know, a black puree in a white bowl. I mean, you want, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, that's great style. It's like this, the little black dress, you know, that style. Especially if you're the Queen of England and have, you know, $50 million diamond brooch stuck to your shoulder. But simplicity <laughs> is the real is the real style. Yeah, Comes no, from the and chefs must stop thinking of themselves stop thinking look at me it's all about me 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 no it's not it's about the ingredients and the customer oh my God. your energy when you put yourself into the food do you think people can taste that do you think that that is an ingredient your energy oh yes because that's the style you know that's the bit that makes it what you can do um and, and people get that if if a kitchen is exciting stars was exciting because you know we change the menu every night every lunch and every night was never the same. So there was an excitement that came from that because we could never believe every night at six o'clock that we had actually done it. Um, so the waiters were on fire, the cooks were on fire, the bartenders, everybody. And that went straight through to the public. That's why people loved it so much. I mean, yeah. Stars was not the greatest food in America, but it was the, the greatest fun. Yes, and I think it's that sizzle. Once again, the ingredient of that sizzle, yes. and. Uh, Donnie Medea, a wonderful restaurateur here in Chicago, was so influenced by you. And he was saying there's no one else who can walk the room, walk the restaurant, be just the, the utmost of the host, the chef, welcoming everyone. And you are just such an inspiration. So I just wanted to share. When you're at the top of your game, when you're there, when everything is like, you know, you're raising the bar over and over, how does it feel to be on top like that? At the very top, you mm. step off. Get off that train mm. you were talking about. That's why I went to the beach. And Anthony Bourdain understood it. Nobody else did. But, uh, you know, okay, my great friend, Nureyev, Rodolf Nureyev, he went on dancing too long. He didn't need the money, he had lots of money. Mm. Um, and, you know, you see, I'm not going to name the people who are still alive, but there is a time to stop and it it starts to become a little sad, uh, not pathetic, but sad when they go on and they start to diminish right in front of our eyes on the same stage where they became our heroes. So that's why I left. I sold stars because I, at the top of the game, it was time to go fishing. <laughs> in my case, <laughs> diving. I'm glad you. I'm glad you talked about mm -hmm. that because we talked about that prior. We didn't want to go and like pry too much about that. Right. But like, when you step off that stage and you turn around and you reverse it and you look in the mirror at the past, right. is there something that, you know, what is the thing that you do? You, obviously, you look back on it and you have to. Um, it's with joy. What's the feeling? Oh yes, it was way way too much fun, and you know, I made enough money to. Um, everyone said, you know, when I sold Star, I think the article in the Chronicle, which won a James Beard Award, by the way, said, you know, for the falling star. And I said, well, my, I went straight to the airport in San Francisco after the check was deposited, or the funds were deposited, and stayed for a month at the Georges Saint in Paris. I said, if that's a falling star, I want to do it over and over and over again. <laughs> well, you know, what is, what is a falling star? What do we all do when we see it? We make a wish, right? And it's something oh, make a wish. Well, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. You truly are, Chef Jeremiah, a hug from heaven. As I like to say, I've, right. I've just experienced oh, hugs oh, from heavens oh, oh, oh. on this journey. And you are a constellation. You are not a star. You are a, the constellation who continues to shine. And that's so exciting about your book that's coming out and your wonderful travels in Mexico featuring the cuisine. One other quick question on culinary. Do you see any trends? The, I mean, the young 
techies and people getting into that kind of that part of the business they're all you know in their 20s and 30s and they're saying you know we want to learn how to cook at home we want to invite friends uh, over to dinner and i thought i thought the dinner party had got gone forever <laughs> so when a 25 year old techie genius from harvard and wharton and penn three phds before he was 30 years old says i want to learn to cook and I want to learn to cook at home and teach people how to do it. Um, then I think, well, wow, that's absolutely wonderful. And it'll be, again, ingredients are the most important thing. And it's not, you know, when you look up a recipe on Google, all those recipes come up and you have no idea which ones are the good ones or anything. But this young man I was talking to the other day said, I wanted to, you know, identify the unknowable and then know how to find it so when it says here's a recipe for frittata and it says you know chop an onion he said i have no clue how to chop an onion and no one i know in my age group knows how to chop an onion so if it all starts at that again and i said but that's all very fine uh but you also have to show them what an onion is you have to show what the perfect onion is what's the difference between an onion out of the garden and one out of the supermarket so the show should also be about benchmarks. And that's what I want. That's what I'm doing in Mexico. I want to do it for show the benchmarks of the old authentic techniques and flavors, and then what to do about it now. Because the food of Mexico, or the food anywhere in the future after this world disaster is not going to be just chefs showing off. I think we've all had that, right? We've all been, we've all been served a big dose of that. We need to put everyone's Italian grandmother back in the kitchen, you know? Oh yes. my God. <laughs> Richard Olney, the great American cookbook author and cook, who was a friend of mine, um, showed me how the difference between a potato gratin in glass, metal, and earthenware. Well, the glass and the metal burn it and cook it too quickly. The earthenware makes that potato cream gratin that we all tasted once and absolutely fell in love with and could never get again because it came, it wasn't from a wood-fired oven, it wasn't in earthenware, and it wasn't in Italy. You know? <laughs> so you have to get that. Uh, everyone's fondest memory of the best grandmother or grandfather, whoever it was, who cooked for them, and That's get right. that somehow with our, with yeah. like in the kitchen that you're sitting in, get that back in there. Well, I have to continue this conversation if we could, but I always Absolutely. like to end each episode of Kitchen Chat with your top three tips for the home chef, talking about bringing it back into the kitchen without all of these artificial intelligence and everything. What are some three basic skills or three top tips for the home for chef? Home, for the home cook. Yes. It, empty out your spice drawer that's got 40 bottles of two-year-old spices <laughs> in it and throw them away and then buy spices as you know by the day or the week as you need in small quantities use them and then go get small uh that you know when they take out paprika that's practically you know off white <laughs> and they wonder why they why the results are not what they tasted before i think it's healthful eating is absolutely more important than ever um, and everyone should take the word sustainable and organic and authentic and natural and real, throw them out with the spices. They don't mean anything. Be careful of those labels, eat healthy food, invite your friends home and cook for them. Uh, and it's all about the ingredients. I think those are my, my tips. And don't be afraid. If you, if you screw it up, you can always make scrambled eggs. That's true. <laughs> oh, Chef Jeremiah Tower, this has just been, it's been fun. amazing. Yeah. Truly, so much fun. And I can't wait to continue the conversation. Please keep us posted on the timing of your book and Absolutely. your series and everything. Our foodie friends here at Kitchen Chat will just love to join you on this Wonderful. journey and, and everything. So thank you so much. Thank and thank you, dear foodie friends. And always remember to take a moment and savor the day. 